This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Hello, I'm Michael Burke. Welcome to a brand new series of Royal Recipes. This time, we're at Western Burt House, formerly a grand country house, now a boarding school, which has played host to royal visitors for over a hundred years. In this series, we're delving even further back in time to reveal over 600 years of royal food heritage. You play Anne Boleyn, <laughs> and I will play Henry VIII. And we've been busy unlocking the secrets of Britain's great food archives, discovering rare and unseen recipes that have been royal favorites through the ages. From the earliest royal cookbook in 1390. It's so precious, so special that I'm not allowed to touch it. To Tudor treats from the court of Henry VIII. I can't wait for this. <laughs> One, two, three. We'll be exploring the great culinary traditions enjoyed by the royal family, from the grand to the groundbreaking, as well as the surprisingly simple. I did think that was going to be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> as we hear from a host of royal chefs. Prince Philip would walk past or pop his head in and say, what's for dinner, what are we having? Oh, yeah, it's not just a normal kitchen. And meet the people who provide for the royal table. It's OK for the Queen, it's OK for everyone. Welcome to Royal Recipes. We're gathering in the Royal Harvest today, celebrating the different kinds of food produced on the Royal Estates up and down the land. Much of it graces the tables at meals from grand Royal occasions to private family get-togethers. Today in the Royal Recipes kitchen, top chef Paul Ainsworth uses poetic license with a fruity cake recipe. It just says in there, serve with cherry sauce. <laughs> so I'm just going to do... <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna Not do very the, helpful, is no, it? No, I'm going to do the best <laughs> I can. Dr Matt Green visits Dirham Park, an estate with a 400-year-old royal connection. Deer have been in these valleys for hundreds of years. Is that what the deer bit means? Deer means deer. deer. OK. And former cook to the Prince of Wales, Carolyn Robb, cooks up a right royal pudding. His Royal Highness Prince Charles was very keen on everything being homegrown. Whatever was in season was what was on the menu for the day. We start our celebration of the royal harvest with the dish served up for a prince's birthday bash. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. We've got unrivaled access to the world's leading historians, with hundreds of documentaries featuring everything from Boudicca to the British royal family. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and real royalty fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use code REALROYALTY at checkout. I'm here in the Royal Recipes kitchen with Michelin-starred chef Paul Ainsworth. What is it this time? So, Michael, we are going to be doing lamb with raspberry sauce. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a version of a dish served at Prince Charles's 50th birthday party at Highgrove. Private dinner cooked by a lesser-known chef called Anton Mossiman. <laughs> What's no, your version? A legend of our industry. So I'm going to sort of try and uh, do Anton proud and do a version of what I think might have been served on that uh, birthday. So, Michael, what I've got here is a saddle. OK, now you've okay. probably used to having the best end or the cutlets, the rack. Yeah. That's what that is, but we've boned it out. So we're going to season it very liberally all over. And, and your butcher would do that? Absolutely. You know, you'll get a saddle of lamb in any butcher. Mm -hmm. okay. So we'll go straight in. Like so. Whee! Nice and sizzling. Yeah. Just add a little, little bit more of that lovely lamb fat, OK? And then we're just going to move it so it doesn't stick on the bottom. Yeah. And then we're just going to basically caramelise that all the way around so it's lovely, starts to kind of go a little bit crisp. Mm, mm, mm. OK, while we're doing that, I'm going to add in some butter now. The butter is just going to add more flavour. Here we're going to add some rosemary, some thyme and some crushed garlic. Turn your heat down. 
Now look at that, just caramelising <laughs> beautifully. It was a private dinner, this 50th birthday party, hosted by the then Camilla Parker Bowles. And it right, rather okay. marked the time of her coming out of the shadows, year after Princess Diana had died. Yeah. Quite a few of the yeah. royals at, uh, at this dinner, but not, interestingly, the Queen and Prince Philip. Whether oh, really? that was because they didn't want at that stage to put the royal seal of approval on that relationship, right? Uh, I don't know. But private party, but obviously a big party. So what's next? So now we're just coming to the end of caramelising this. See how I've got that lovely, gorgeous, even colour going yeah. all the way around? Yeah. So now that, we take off, we turn the heat off, OK? And that goes into our tray like so. Yeah. Now what do I do with this? Now if you could take that to the oven. The oven's yeah. been preheated at 180. Yeah. That is going to go in there for about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. okay. Remembering we want this nice and pink. But only 15, 20 minutes. 15, cooking. 20 minutes. That's it. Mm. That's it. Okay there Michael. Yep. Good. And you should find next to the rested lamb another little present for you. Oh yeah I got it. Oh, it's been resting. It's been resting for quite some time because the pan itself is pretty cool. And look, look what I found. The fairies at the bottom of the garden have left some potatoes. Pomme boulangère. Oh, really? Now, yes. what is that? Uh, well, baker's, 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 baker's potato. Yeah. Called pomme boulangère because yeah. the bakers would finish baking all the bread, yeah. turn their ovens off, and then for dinner, yeah. they would slice potatoes with onions, stock, place it in the oven and just use the residual heat to cook it. And then that's where Pomme Boulangere came oh, from. Right. They look nice. Beautifully browned off at the top. Now, Michael, in yep. this pan here, I've just turned the heat on. I'm going to make us a really nice dark lamb gravy, OK? So in here, Michael, I've got the bones from the saddle. Chop them up, we've roasted them off. We have a mirepoix of vegetables, which is carrot, leek, celery and onion. Some thyme, some rosemary, a little bit of bay leaf some garlic and some white peppercorns. Next, glug of white wine. Oh, yeah. White wine with red meat? Absolutely. Now, I often get asked that question, and whenever we do lamb sauce, we always make it with white wine. And the reason being, it's nice and dry, bags of acidity, which works really, really well with the lamb. And also, lamb's quite a strong flavour. We yeah. don't want that kind of rich red wine in there. No. What we want to do is reduce that right down, so we're burning off the alcohol yeah. and just left with those wonderful tannings of the wine, giving us that nice acidity. Okay. Next, lamb stock, mm -hmm. obviously, so it goes naturally. Yeah. So now I'm gonna also going to add in there some veal stock. Why? You've got now, the lamb stock there already. We've got the lamb stock, but what we get from the veal stock is body, and that's coming from the gelatine out the bone. It was a private dinner, but obviously a pretty grand occasion. According to the newspaper reports, um, Camilla Parker Bowles actually wore a diamond necklace that had belonged to her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, right. who'd been the mistress of Edward VII. Right, OK. <laughs> it's amazing, yeah. the sort of continuity. Yes. Uh, the continuity there, <laughs> he said delicately. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Prince Charles is, the, uh, is now the oldest Prince of Wales. Right, OK. Because Bertie, who became Edward VII, uh, Alice Keppel, his mistress, uh, he became king at 60. Right, OK. And Prince Charles is a decade older than that already. Yeah. Yeah. OK, how's it going? Lovely. Really important tip here, Michael. Mm -hmm. Can you see that on the top? Well, yeah, a bit it's... of scum on the top. Yeah, and that's fat. Right. So what you do, just put your ladle into the middle, Work it to the outside, yeah. and then just skim it off like so, all the way around. Now we're just going to sieve it yep. into this pan. Goodness. We haven't stopped the cooking. See how it's gone straight into yep. a rolling boil like that? Yeah. So this is where my spin comes in on this raspberry sauce. We're going to add raspberry vinegar. Raspberry vinegar? Yeah, raspberry vinegar. I've never heard of that. Well, it's just raspberries just, in vinegar. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So just the infusion. You can buy this in the. Uh... Get, yeah, get that oh, yeah. easily. You didn't put just, much in? No. A little bit more. Mm hmm. I thought so. A <laughs> little okay. bit of butter. Oh, of course. It's just going to give it a wonderful glaze. Mm hmm. Fresh raspberries. Yep. Just going to put those in. You're just dropping them just in. Just dropping You're those in. Them in any way. And now I just want the heat of the sauce just to slowly break them down. I'm just going to let that, those raspberries, just sit there and infuse into that lamb sauce. It's very much the Scottish national fruit, isn't it? Yes. And do you oh, know, in the 50s, they used to have trains bringing raspberries down from Scotland that they called the raspberry specials. The raspberry specials? Yep, yep, yep. Ever seen these before? Have a taste. Mmm. 
That's mustard. Mustard. And very strong flavour. Really strong flavour. Very strong flavour. It's not a kind of, you know, I half think it's mustard. Mustard greens. Okay? Mustard and they're greens. Very, they're a brassica. They're very much like kale. Yeah. Grown in this country and absolutely delicious. They're terrific. We're going to keep it really simple. A little bit of oil, a little bit of butter, mm. salt, pepper, done. Into the pan like so. Mm -hmm. Seasoning in straight away, Michael. Yep. Actually... <gasps> It's really quite hot. Yeah. <laughs> what happens is, well, when they cook down like this, they yep. actually do the um, heat of the mustard mellow slightly. Oh, right, right. And just a little splash, not much, of water, just to steam it. Just wilt them down like so. Yep. Done. You know, um, uh, Prince Charles raises uh, organic lamb at Highgrove and apparently supplies uh, some of the local butchers something that was really not public knowledge until quite recently. Right, OK. Yeah. Oh, it looks good, doesn't it? Beautifully pink. So, yeah. plating up time. See how the they cook greens. down. My new favourite vegetable <laughs> that I hadn't heard of ten minutes ago. Take that beautiful piece of lamb. See how the raspberries have just basically just broken down? Yeah. But we've got that lovely, dark richness of the sauce. Like the so. sauce does look good, doesn't it? Does look You've good, done a good job it? on that. And now we're just going to look at these beautiful pomme boulangere potatoes. And there you have it. Lamb with raspberry sauce and boulangere potatoes. Let's go. Let's yes. go. Mm. You've got the richness of the lamb, cut by the acidity of the raspberries and the taste of the raspberries. It's not something I would have thought of. It does work. Do you know, after they had this dish, they got up and danced to ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> dancing the dancing, dancing <laughs> queen, I expect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is more than I'd ever be able to do after this. A classic joint of British lamb with a distinctive fruity twist. A homegrown delight fit for the royal table. One type of meat that was for centuries the preserve of royalty and the nobility is venison. Originally exclusive hunting grounds, deer parks became a feature of many royal and aristocratic estates. Matt Green has been to Durham Park near Bath to find out more. For over a thousand years, there were more deer parks in Britain than any other part of the world. At one time, no royal or nobleman who was worth his salt could possibly be without one. But setting up your own deer park wasn't a simple process. It required a royal sanction. Historian Neil Stacey tells Matt Moore. So why did you need an official licence for a hunting park? Well, the kings from Norman times claimed sovereignty over hunting. So if you wanted a private park in mm. order to hunt, you needed a licence from the king. Otherwise it was illegal? Uh, yes, it was. It was a case of having a park so that you could keep other people out. Right. <laughs> Nobody else yeah. could hunt in your park, and for that you needed a licence. So that, uh, the penalty, which is in here, is £10, mm. um, which in today's money is about £11,000. So it was a hefty, was a hefty, hefty fine if, if anyone was hunting in Durham Park without mm. permission. That was the... Bankruptcy. It would break the bank of most poachers right, yeah. <laughs> in a very serious way. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> Henry VIII granted Durham Park a licence in 1511. It was a major status symbol, allowing its owner, William Dennis, to fence in 500 acres solely for hunting deer. It was the Great Council of England who was right. issuing uh, and each of their departments would have required a, a bit of a fee. Whatever was paid doesn't appear in the records because mm. that sort of money doesn't. <laughs> it could take a number of weighty bribes to get a licence approved. And it's an amazing sort of document here. Like it's a beautifully preserved, it is. wonderful kind of hand. Of the Absolutely, script written in. and with gold leaf in the tag. And that's real with, gold That's in there. real gold in there and the Great Seal of England with the king mm -hmm. on it, uh, sitting in, in majesty with mm -hmm. the orb and the scepter. To have a licence showed that you were 
in touch with the royal court. And, and possibly a few gentry neighbours thought, well, I wish I had one of them. Mm. Noblemen used their parks for hunting deer, and the meat was very highly prized. Sir Neil, where are we? We are at the, on the site of the hunting lodge. The hunting lodge? Which was converted into farm buildings. And so, but it was here, this was the site, because it has a stunning view. It was the place the great and the good gathered to watch the hunt. In the Tudor era, being offered venison was a mark of great generosity, even affection. It seems a little odd today, but back in 1527, a smitten Henry VIII sent Anne Boleyn the carcass of a deer he'd killed on the hunt. So would Henry VIII himself have hunted here? We can't say. I think it's unlikely. William Dennis was uh, close to him. There's no sign that Henry VIII didn't like him. Yeah. And it would not have been a friendly thing for the Kim king to come and visit him with right. his entire court. Because it would bankrupt It would bankrupt, you. yes. Deer have been an important feature of Durham Park for centuries. Dale Dennehy is the man responsible for looking after them. So here we have a quintessential park view. Yeah. In the distance, watching us very closely, a herd of deer. This could have been a scene 500 years ago, you know, with the mm. trees and the landscape and the deer then sheltering under there. They are a wild herd contained. Mm -hmm. It's a historic part of the site, mm -hmm. and we want their condition to always remain tip-top. We want the deer to remain here forever because the history of Durham is all, it's a Saxon name. Deer have been in these valleys uh -huh. for hundreds of years. Is that what the Durr bit means? Durr means deer. deer. OK. Just as in the 16th century, these deer are an important source of food for the estate. Venison itself is uh, quite a high status food. Actually, the meat of kings and yeah. aristocracy years ago. Today, it's for everybody. For everybody, and yeah. And it's a really, really healthy meat. I yeah. look forward to tucking into some later. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Go to the TV. I won't say that too loudly in case they hear. <laughs> <laughs> Once, venison and deer parks could only be appreciated by kings and nobility. Now both can be enjoyed by all of us. The royals pride themselves on eating homegrown produce, like British asparagus. Queen Victoria loved it so much that her gardeners at Osborne House even managed to cultivate it for her to enjoy at Christmas. What are you cooking now? So we're doing a beautiful crown of asparagus. Asparagus, royal favourite, down the generations. Absolutely, with some gorgeous Cornish crab and some rapeseed mayonnaise. And it's very similar to a recipe in a recent Buckingham Palace cookbook. Oh, OK. So we've got the white meat and the brown meat, yeah. OK? And that's what we're going to get on with first. We're going to okay. make a mayonnaise, OK? Now, okay. this is a test of a chef, isn't it? One Making egg. a decent mayonnaise. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's been known to be tricky, but yeah, you yeah. know what you do. Not when you're doing it. No, absolutely. So we're just going to whisk this egg, Michael, yeah. OK? This stage we call the Sabion stage. And what that is... Sabion? Sabion stage. So what we're doing, we're adding some vinegar, white wine vinegar, to um, one egg. We're going to add in a little bit of Dijon mustard. Dijon mustard Dijon rather mustard. than English I know, mustard? I know. I know people use English mustard in mayonnaise, don't they? The Dijon mustard, um, to be fair, is it's a bit milder. Yeah. And it has a nice acidity. And yeah. I love English mustard. Yeah. But we've got to remember, this is the star of the show. And the asparagus and the crab are very light. So you prefer something weak and French? <laughs> no, I meant, you know, <laughs> more delicate, more yeah. delicate. More delicate, more delicate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. OK. All right, so we're going to whisk that together like yeah. so. Now, I'm ready for you to help me here, Michael. OK. In that jug is equal quantities of rapeseed oil yeah. and vegetable oil. Why two okay. oils? Two oils. One, rapeseed now in this country is being produced on a big scale and it's yeah. absolutely delicious. Yeah. OK, and secondly, it's very strong and, again, crab, asparagus, we just want to let it down a little bit with the vegetable oil. Which not too much taste, taste in the not oil. Not too much taste. That's it. Lovely. And you now start to see it going velveteen thick. It's looking really good. It's look. Oh, honestly, you'd almost think it to come out of a bottle. <laughs> Sometimes it's a long it's job. Well. This, it you know? is a long job. Yeah. But it's worth it, isn't it? Because yeah. mayonnaise really, really makes well, these dishes. You're just dishes. enjoying seeing me working like this. I am actually. I've seen you. Can we swap it a second? <laughs> no, come on. You're fitter than me. <laughs> Could you do this yeah. with a machine? You could, but I've got my very own Michael Burke 
um, standing by, so why would I want the machine? <laughs> okay. Last bit, last bit, keep going. All the way. All, all the way, way the lot. That's it. All, all of it. There we go. Fantastic. That's your lot, I'm afraid. And look at that, mayonnaise. We're just going to move that to the side, grab our bowl here, and now we're going to add some beautiful, sweet white crab meat, which comes from the claw. The white meat is, is, is lovely. Lovely, lovely and sweet. So you've put some lemon zest in yeah. it and your, the juice as well. Now I'm going to add some seasoning. A bit of salt. OK. Sea Not salt, much, because you've got that lovely, soft kind of salt that comes from crab mm -hmm. naturally anyway. A little bit of cracked back pepper. Some chives. Yep. Mayonnaise. Just a couple of dots. I do not want to let it go too runny. And that yep. looks delicious, doesn't it? Mm. Right, so now we're going to add the crab into this piping bag. Yep. Get that all down to there, and we'll come back to that in a second, OK? okay? So these will move over here, and now we're going to come to the crowning glory, which is <laughs> the asparagus. Now, tell me about asparagus. This is a great British ingredient, isn't it? A great British ingredient, Michael, and you're absolutely right. Something we grow so well in this country. Traditionally, the season, the total season, is from St George's Day to the summer solstice. So what's that? Right. April the 23rd to June the 21st? June, yeah, that's absolutely spot on. And that's yeah. the long season. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we've got the kind of climate where we can't grow everything. No. But the things we do grow are really top quality stuff. Really tasty. You would not believe how quick it grows. Like, in a day, it can grow up to as much as, like, one and a half inches, two inches really? in a day. Good gracious. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Why is it so expensive, then? It's only around for a very, very short while. For someone growing asparagus, it's only a very short time for them to make any kind of money. Well, I mean, people say it's very good for hangovers. Yeah. People say it's an aphrodisiac. But I don't know if there's any truth in that. Um, Perhaps that's why it's royal food, do you think? <laughs> While we're going around here, I'm going to tell you how I've cooked the asparagus. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is in boiling salted water, OK, we've blanched it for about 45 seconds. We then take it out and refresh it into ice water. Now, the reason we do that, Michael, is to, one, stop the cooking, but also, as well, that will keep that really nice, vibrant colour. It does look fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, but it's fiddly, isn't it? It is fiddly. I mean, imagine doing it for a royal banquet. And with your hourly rates, this would be a very expensive dish, <laughs> wouldn't it? Yeah, you, <laughs> you wouldn't want me making this. No, 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 no. <laughs> Last one in. Now, this will push it against the sides. Yeah, yeah. Whoa! All the way. Oh, that's wonderful, isn't it? OK, like that. Now, with a teaspoon. Oh, well done, Paul. You've got a delicate touch for a big man. For a big man. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say I've got the Midas touch. Well, yeah, yeah. And there we go. Now, what happens now? Asparagus crap. That now goes into the fridge yep. for a, about an hour. An hour. All right? OK. OK, and right out on. there, there should be another one for you to bring back and for us to plate up. OK. Here we go. OK, Michael? Yep. How's it looking? So, Paul, I can offer you the crown. Thank you very much. Where shall I put it? Down here? Just there. Thank you very yeah. much. So we're just going to get our beautiful crown of asparagus. Oh, now, be careful here. You don't want to leave half of it. Straight onto the plate, like right. so. OK? Yeah. Now, we leave that ring on and we just do some nice finishing touches now, OK? okay. So we're just going to put a nice wedge of lemon on the, on the side of the plate, like yeah. so. Now, we're going to get some of those lovely chives just mm -hmm. to finish over the top, like that. Bit more lemon zest. This is my kind of dish, actually. Do you like really this? Like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like nice. the fresh tastes. Yeah. Okay. Love crab, love asparagus. Rather you than me. Oh. Oh. <laughs> we just finished that. That looks terrific, Paul. With some brioche. I did think. That was going to be a disaster, then. You know that lovely rapeseed oil? Yeah. Just like that. Be careful, there. though. Just down the side, so it's just running off that asparagus. That does look brilliant. And it? Mr Michael Burke, <laughs> your crown of asparagus. Oh. I think it's a shame to... It is. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you won't be I think feeling too guilty for long. No. <laughs> please. Go on, please. You, no, you, after you. Go on, sure, please. Sure. Yeah, it's for you. Shall I go down the... Yeah, go for it. Go for it. A bit of the asparagus. That's it. A bit of the crab. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy to eat, this, actually. Oh, yeah. mm. Mm. How's that? Oh, that? Oh, it's lovely. And the difference in the textures mm. and the explosion of taste. Mm. 
It was Louis XIV, the Sun King of France, who said that asparagus was the food of kings. Mm. So you can't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was <laughs> Freshly harvested asparagus, wonderful produce, homegrown for the royal table, wherever it may be. The royals are known to take food with them when they travel. Former royal chef Carolyn Robb recalls one excursion where she used produce from the royal harvest to knock up a classic British pudding in a very unlikely setting. Having spent more than a decade as cook to the Prince of Wales, Carolyn Robb is adept at creating the finest meals using fresh seasonal produce from the Royal Gardens. Today I'm making apple and cinnamon crumble with the blackberry cream. This is a real classic British dessert. His Royal Highness Prince Charles was very keen on everything being organic, everything being homegrown. Whatever was in season was what was on the menu for the day. Puddings made from fruit from the royal harvest are a favourite of the prince. Blackberries and apples are some of the finest fruits of the British autumn. The perfect time of year for a warming pudding. When the apples are this big, you only need a couple. <laughs> for the filling, Carolyn coats the diced apples in butter, sugar and cinnamon and cooks them over a high heat for about five minutes. Bramley apples are very tart, but cooking them like this, caramelising them slightly, just adds a lovely level of flavour. I've cooked in a lot of different kitchens, in palaces and castles, all over the world. They were all very different, but the ones that I liked the most were the homely kitchens. Nearly there. The apples are all cooked now. So I'm just going to add in a little bit of finely grated lime zest. This smells absolutely wonderful. Over the years, Carolyn has concocted this crumble in some far-flung corners of the world. I remember making it on a royal tour in Bhutan, and the king of Bhutan was coming for dinner. We had apples from Highgrove that I'd taken with me, as well as some of the wonderful cream from the dairy at Windsor. Now I'm going to make the apple crumble topping. I've got some butter, oats, some plain flour, muscovado sugar, a little bit more cinnamon. Then I've got a few pecan nuts here. This is optional. Some people like nuts, some don't, but I just love the flavour that they add. So I'm just pop in a couple of those, and then I always like to put a bit of vanilla in too. So. This is a vanilla bean paste, so it's quite concentrated, so we just need a couple of drops. And that's done. This has got a few little chunks in it, which makes it all the nicer when it's cooked. Simple desserts like this, made with the fruits of the Royal Gardens, are sure to be a winner. Carolyn pops the individual crumbles into a preheated oven at 180 degrees for 15 to 20 minutes. And while they're baking, she prepares a blackberry cream. For many years when I was making crumble, I always used to just mix the blackberries in with the apple. And then one day I decided it would be nice to try something a little different. So that's why I now puree them and put them in with the cream. These cook down quite quickly. The only thing to be careful of is that the liquid doesn't all evaporate and then they don't burn on the bottom of the pan. But they smell delicious. And interestingly, when they cook, they turn from being black to a beautiful um, dark red color. Carolyn's blackberries are cooked with sugar, water, and a little vanilla until soft. Then they're blended into a puree. I'm keeping my hand over the top so I don't get covered in blackberry puree. That looks fine. 
Now I'm going to rub it through a sieve to get rid of any pips that are in there. I think it's really worth doing this extra little step just to get the pips out. There we go, that's looking good. Mmm, that's delicious, but I think it could do just a little more sugar. The puree is cooled in the fridge before Carolyn drizzles it over whipped cream. Crumbles are ready now. They're smelling absolutely delicious. I'm getting a little bit of a scent of cinnamon, um, the lovely toasted pecans, and obviously the lovely caramelised apple smell too. I'm going to present it on a wooden board. Um, just got some blackberry leaves that I picked in the garden earlier. I always like to try and make things as pretty as I can. I think that's a dessert fit for a king. Many types of British fruit are highly regarded all over the world. There's even a long history of harvesting cherries here. And many of them are grown in Kent, which has been known as the Garden of England for over 400 years. Cherry orchards were established here back in 1533 by fruiterer to Henry VIII, Richard Harris. Today, a cherry stone's throw from the original Tudor planting is Brogdale Farm, home to the National Fruit Collection. Michael Austin, a retired fruit grower, knows a thing or two about cherries. His family has farmed these soils since the 1800s. This area here is right in the centre of the North Kent fruit belt and it's an ideal soil, quite close to the sea, so you don't get the very heavy frost you do further inland. These Kentish orchards boast the widest variety of fruit in the world. The whole cherry collection is roughly 320 varieties. The role of the National Fruit Collection, as with all collections, is conserving the old varieties and stopping them from dying out. The Royals are keen supporters of the National Fruit Collection. In recent decades, the Prince of Wales even helped save it. Prince Charles helped keep the collections going when funding was withdrawn in 1989. And thanks to the Duchy of Cornwall, the money was put up to buy the farm to keep the collections on site and keep them going. He actually visited the farm in 1993 to make sure his money's been spent well. <laughs> It helped to keep the collections going and keep them in this one place. Prince Charles is well known for his love of fruit trees. There are many planted in his gardens at Highgrove. But he's not the only royal to have a particular liking for cherries. Back in the 17th century, Queen Anne claimed cherries to be the finest of all fruits. But it was a Tudor king who was the driving force behind cherry production here. Right, so this is the Flemish Red, which was brought in by Richard Harris, who was fruiterer to Henry VIII. And Henry VIII was instrumental in trying to re revolutionise fruit growing. And he brought in a lot of varieties from the continent to resurrect the fruit industry in this country. A uh, bit on the sharp side, probably not everyone's taste, probably much better if they're cooked in a, in a pie. For Henry VIII, growing cherries wasn't just about eating them. During the Tudor period, fruit was an expensive luxury and his orchards were an expression of his wealth and status. His love for cherries helped make them the fruit of choice among the elite, trend that continued into the 19th century. Right, this is Turkey Heart, which is a Victorian variety. And you'll see we're now getting into a much darker cherry and much sweeter. There was a great deal of interest in everything horticultural in Victorian times, and tremendous amount of new varieties of all fruits were produced through the era. And uh, some of these varieties carried on into the 20th century, but now considered either too small or not heavy enough yield to be a commercial variety these days. Many of the cherries enjoyed by the royals throughout our history have been grown here at Brogdale. They're still hand-picked, just like in the days of Henry VIII. 
it's a very difficult crop to harvest mechanically, so you've got to, you've got to pick it by hand. And when you're picking the fruit, you've got to be uh, very careful with it, make sure you pick it with the stalk on, because if you plumb it or pull, pull the cherry off without the stalk, uh, it'll go rotten very quickly. These cherries here are absolutely delicious. Lovely sweet flavor, plenty of juice, and really fantastic. Nothing like a, a good Kentish cherry. Cherries still feel a real luxury, so it's great yes. to know that they can grow in such abundance here. Super, super delicious, and guess what? We're going to do our old friend Mildred. Uh, Mildred uh, Nichols? Mildred Nichols, her cherry cake. Mildred Nichols joined the kitchen staff of Buckingham Palace in 1907 as seventh kitchen maid, and she was there for 12 years, got all the way up to third kitchen maid, and she left this recipe book. And here it is, cherry cake. Yeah. And this is what you're going to do. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. OK. To the recipe. And we're just going to, we're going to do the cherry sauce quite, because it just says in there, serve with cherry sauce. <laughs> so I'm just going to do, I'm going to do the helpful, is No, it? I'm going to do the best I can to do Mildred Proud. Yeah. Right, Michael, in here. Cream, butter and sugar. Absolutely. That's what she <laughs> <Yes>. says. <laughs> just basically dissolving the sugar into our nice soft butter. OK, what we're going to do now, Michael, is separate four eggs, OK? So I'm going to put the yolks into this bowl and give you the whites to whisk up to stiff okay. peaks for me, please. So, like so. We're just going to separate our eggs. Oh, we've got a double yolk, Michael. <laughs> Look at that! <laughs> I think that means we're going to need one, one less egg. Hmm. So, in there is two. <laughs> <laughs> Economical, that's you. Another, Another double yoker. I know about this because I've got twins yeah. uh, and I looked it up previously. The chances of getting a double yoker are a thousand to one. So we've been very lucky today. Well, more than very lucky. If it's a thousand to one to get one double yoker, two double yokers, it must be a million to one. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah. I told you, it's me and you. Yeah. I'm the mathematician, it's, you're it's, the cook. Get yes. on with it. <laughs> <laughs> Right, if you could whisk those up for me, please, Michael, okay. into stiff peaks. Now, I'm going to just basically fold these rich yolks into our um, creamed sugar and butter. How stiff do you want your peaks? Stiff. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely perfect, thank you. Brilliant. You are getting very good at this, Michael. Well, very, very good. Just going to put some of our egg white into not, our mix. Not all of it. Not all of it. I'm going to fold a little bit in it at a time. Just before we do fold it in, I've just added in some breadcrumb. Okay. Would you, would, would you normally use breadcrumb? No, you wouldn't. And in Mildred's book, a lot of the recipes are stale biscuits or breadcrumb. And that's because after 1918, flour was rationed. So this was actually a great way of kind of bulking the recipe and giving you that kind of cake mix texture. Yeah, 1918, end of the First World War, rationing. Uh, applied, to, applied to Buckingham Palace as much as everybody else. OK, now what now? Now, those moulds next to you, Michael, they're called Savran moulds. Mm -hmm. They're actually brilliant moulds for cooking cake recipes like this because you see the hole in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you finish finished. Yeah, sorry, right. sorry, sorry. Basically, the heat will rush up and will give you a lovely cooking temperature right the way around your cake. Consistent across Consistent the whole cake. Consistent right the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to get our piping bag. Yep. Put in our cake mix. With the bag, yep. you've got far more control of getting it in nice and neat. Now, before I put this cake mix in, you'll see with these Savron moulds, Michael, I've mm. brushed them with butter, yep. and then I've lined them with some of that breadcrumb, yep. and that's also going to give us a nice texture on the outside of the cake. Bit of crunch? Bit of crunch, and you've got the butter. And we're not going to go all the way to the top. We're just going to go it, around. It's going to rise. Twice it's going to rise because we've got that egg in there. Not shortchanging so, us. No, then. I'm not shortchanging you. Mm. <laughs> would yeah. I, Michael? Would I do that mm, to you? I think you might. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, see at this stage, do not be alarmed. It does feel like it's quite almost coarse, the texture of it yeah. is quite coarse. That is the that is the breadcrumb. Okay. 
But like I say, that's what, you know, Mildred was working with what she had, you know, so she didn't have any flour. So it was an, a brilliant way of utilising up ingredients that were would otherwise go as waste. What are you doing that for? So just evening the mix out. Okay. Now, if those could go in the oven, please. Yeah. 180 for 25 minutes. 180, 25 minutes, okay. Right, cherry sauce time. Oh, now the business. <laughs> Do you like cherries, Michael? I love them. And, you know, if, if sayings are anything to go by, they are the ultimate luxury fruit, aren't they? You know, you cherry pick. Some thinks the cherry on the cake, cake you know, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Life's a bowl of cherries. Cherries. Mm -hmm. Now, this sauce is really, really simple. So, cherry. Woo. Like so. <laughs> that pan was hot. A little bit of brandy. This is it, cherry. Is, is that cherry brandy? Cherry brandy. Do you remember, you won't, you were too, obviously, uh, not even born, but Prince Charles, when he was underage, went into a pub and tried to order a cherry brandy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when asked afterwards why, you said it was the only drink he could think of. Well, I couldn't imagine him ordering a pint of lager. <laughs> <laughs> so in here we've got one star anise, yep. some sugar, yep. some cherry brandy, yep. nice full heat because those they're Morello cherries, all right? Yep. So they're nice and juicy, nice and Very soft. Very juicy. Then I'm going to add a little bit of thyme. Why? Because thyme works with so many things and it's brilliant with fruit and it's absolutely gorgeous with cherries. Right, a little splash of water. Mm -hmm. Right, while that's cooking away, that's going to take about 10 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got two surprises for you two. today, but I'm only going to reveal one now. I know what one is. <laughs> well, we hope it's... <laughs> we hope it's, uh, cakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'd be a bit of a... <laughs> if it's a turkey, <laughs> <laughs> we're really stuffed. <laughs> okay. You're on fire. I am. <laughs> now, over here, we've got some cinnamon and some sugar whisked together. We're just going to take one of them yeah. into the sugar, all over, round like that. And that just adds another texture, lovely flavour of that cinnamon, oh, the cinnamon. cherry. Mm. So we're just going to great combination. Shake it off, yep. and that's going to go into the middle of our plate like that. So next, we're going to come back to our cherries. Now, could you pass me a lemon, please? Yep. And the reason for that, we've got a lot of sweetness in there. Mm -hmm. We just need to add a little bit of acidity, always, just to cut it. Now the thyme's done its job, so we're yep. just going to lift that out. Time out. <laughs> Michael, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Look at it. Oh, yeah. So we're just going to take some of the, our cherries and the cherries spoon still them quite in. Cherries whole, aren't Yeah. They? And you want that. Aren't you tempted to kind of poke them down? Put some in the outside. Yeah, we can poke, we can poke them down. But they're very hot. <laughs> <laughs> You've got yeah. asbestos fingers. Uh, it's on. OK. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll burn myself for you. Bit more of that sauce. Yeah. OK. Yeah. We're still going. Yeah. Oh, some Devon cream. <laughs> <laughs> Cornish All right. clotted cream. Cornish clotted cream. On top, like so. That looks terrific. But we're not finished. Oh, you, you mentioned... No, I said I had two surprises Yeah, yeah, for yeah. You. I thought you'd forgotten the other one. This is Mildred's knife. Really? Yeah. Green and Son Cutler to Her Majesty Windsor. <laughs> and then even on, the, even on the heel, right here on the handle, pastry made. <laughs> That's amazing. Isn't that amazing. That's Mildred's knife. Over 100 years old. Over 100 it? years old. Wow. Come on. Use, okay. it, use it to cut her cake. Cherry, clotted cream, beautiful cake, that lovely cinnamon sugar. Let's have it. This is a taste of Edwardian England, isn't it? That's good. It's lovely, isn't it? Mmm. We love the cherries. The cream goes well, but it's got real texture. That's a lovely. Lovely combination. I think Mildred really deserved her promotion to third kitchen maid, don't you? Oh, in my mind, she was the kitchen maid. <laughs> well done, Mildred. Join us next time for more royal recipes. Goodbye.